Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. This is episode 26 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. My guest today is Daniel Kong on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Daniel, how are you? How's it going, guys? Uh, good, doing great. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually, I noticed you from social media. Obviously, I'm on social media a lot and I look for investors on there. Mm-hmm. Saw what you were doing and saw that you were pretty new to the space. How long have you actually been actively investing in real estate? About four years now. I think it's almost four years. Yeah, just about yeah. four years investing. So growing up, was it was real estate something you were interested in or did it all happen four years ago when you got the bug for real estate? Or was it a book? How did you get into it? It was, that, it was crazy. It's actually like I had zero real estate experience up to that point. I was working as a software developer like the majority of my life. And then like long story short, somebody gave me rich dad, poor dad, where I think like a lot of people. And then like, yeah. this book, it like literally like, blew my mind. Like that, I was happy. I was working. I had like a decent salary, and I lived in Hawaii, so I I thought there was no way I would ever afford a house. Like not, and like absolutely no, like um, yeah, just like absolutely nothing about real estate. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and just like my mind opened to this whole world of this. I just the concept of passive income. Like I I never even considered the concept of passive income before, but like the whole concept of passive income, that's kind of what started the whole journey of the the real estate investing and like this whole like. Yeah. Did it strike you because it was a way out of a nine to five job or was it something about just acquiring assets and being able to use them the way you want to produce that future passive income? I think that's the idea of financial freedom, of just being able to like be to have a salary, but actually not have to work at it. And I actually like my job as a software developer. I had yeah. a lot of flexibility and like I could work with like my own hours and things. But the whole idea, okay, I can build something and just have complete, like I could basically do whatever I want and not even work and I still be able to support myself and my family. That to me, that was like a, a huge, just like eye opening moment for me when I read that for that. Yeah. Why did somebody give you the book, though? That's what I'm curious to know, because I think that's where it really lies for a lot of people. What was it that somebody thought that you might get out of it at that time? It was just a random friend. This is like, hey, like the other like, yeah, I like I always enjoy reading. I think reading and learning. I think that's something that I just naturally like to do is like, I was like, hey, I'm looking to read a book. Do you have any suggestions? He's like, hey, try this book. It's, it's well known. I was like, OK, sure. Like, and so I, it was like a super just a random like act from like, a random friend. Yeah. Yeah. But good job by you to just want to go in and read it. And then it completely changed your life in just one read. Whereas a lot of people would just say, oh, you know what, that doesn't sound that interesting, but you gave it a try. What was it specific? Was it really the the full passive? I like when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read it once every couple of years. I focus on either Rich Dad or Poor Dad, and I see the messages in both. What was it inside the book that started to get you interested beyond just like the income? Because there's so many stories in there, I think, in terms of how you work ethic, growing up, what you're looking to do, what else inspired you to move forward? And then we'll talk about how you got into your first properties. I think that's maybe two things. One was like the idea of assets and liabilities, like literally I had zero financial education. So like all all I knew was like, don't rack up credit card debt. That was like the only advice I had, like just don't rack up credit card debt. And like I had zero, I had zero else other than that, but just the idea of what an asset and a liability was, that was really huge. And then the thing where I think one of his key phrases is don't ask, I can't, but how can I? And so that, that concept of the rich dad, poor dad, because I think I had poor, like I had the poor dad parents were like the get a job, get an education and like yeah. the safety of that. And so that was like the only world that I knew. And the fact that there was another world that existed beyond that was just like, it was like you peel back the curtains to like just what's possible. I think. Yeah. That's awesome. So what was your first action step forward after you read the book to really get into it and then eventually to get to a property? 
Actually, what's funny was like when after I read the book, I was like, hey, I'm a software, de- a software developer. I thought stocks and stock investing would be the way to build passive income and kind of like quit my job. So like I deep dove, I read a ton of books into just like stock, the stock market investing, how to create a passive investment portfolio that way. After all my research, it basically came down to the conclusion that there's no way to safely invest unless you do index funds for a long period of time. And so like the from my conclusion, I figured like stocks was not the right path. Then I started looking into the real estate investing, and then I found bigger pockets. I think I read the book by Brandon Turner, the book on rental property investing. That was like yeah. my first, like the my first like real estate book. And then like the, from there, I literally read like like three or four books a week, just like on real estate investing. Listened to hundreds of hours of just podcasts, dove into the bigger pockets forums, and like that. Bigger pockets was basically like my my college degree in real estate investing that kind of got me started from kind of launched me into my career. Yeah. So many people that I talk to, so many friends that I have from Bigger Pockets say the same thing. When you got started, were you involved in the forums too? Or you were someone who was just reading the books and like lurking through the forums? I know a lot for a lot of people, they just read forums and then one day they finally post and they're like, wow, there's a lot of people out here who are willing to help just for free, for fun. Yeah, it was a combination of both. I was like very heavy to just reading, reading, listening. And then like when I was ready to start taking action, I started reaching out through the forums and making some friendships and getting some feedback. And I had like, it's, it was back in the day, I want to say like the Hawaii community didn't have a really big, strong investor community. But then the forums was like that. There was a way for me to connect with other investors when I had questions or needed some help or advice or even boots on the ground at the, on the out-of-state investing. That was kind of like the two of those available to me at that point in time. Yeah, I think a lot of people thought like you did, it's so expensive in Hawaii, how am I going to be able to invest here? And then it was really like, it was probably around four years ago when Brandon ended up moving to Hawaii three or four years ago. And then everybody started to go. And then a lot of people, including our former guest, Zasha, developed some real estate meetups there, including yourself. And now it's really taken off. I think that you found like, it's doable. Are all of your properties now in Hawaii? No, I actually, I started out out of state just because... Like when I first started, obviously I had no real estate experience and I had no money to begin with. I thought Hawaii was like, it just was like, it was another th- impossible market. It was like, yeah. it doesn't make sense. It doesn't cash flow positive. There's the houses are a million dollars. There's, I'm never going to be the saving money. I never thought I would own a home too. Like I was like, I'm fine renting for the rest of my life. I just want to get some rentals and pay for my rent like in the future. That was kind of like my plan. Well, yeah. Exactly. So how did you get into a first property? Where was it and where did the deal come from? Yeah, so being a kind of a nerd and a software developer, I'm big on like um, software and like running numbers. And so what I did, one of my first things I did was I wrote a script that scrapes like a whole bunch of like turnkey websites online. And I compiled them into this database of price to rent and ran these formulas and found like the uncertain markets on average, they just cash flow better than other markets. And so from all my data I compiled, I was like, okay, I narrowed it down to maybe like five markets where I think it was like Oklahoma City, Indianapolis. Kansas City, Memphis, a few things where on average, the houses, just like the average turnkey houses, the cash flow, like better on average. So if you're going to use a burn strategy, which was like a huge way where I thought I'd be able to like buy rentals was yeah. the exit makes it a lot easier if, if the average thing cash flows, right? So like did some analysis, like basically settled on Indianapolis of all places to start building my portfolio. And so that's where I started as out of state. So. Yeah. So I think what a lot of people want to know when you go in out of state first, how were you able to build a funnel into Indianapolis so you felt comfortable with an agent, contractors if you needed? Did you do it through bigger pockets or other sources? Because I think that's where people can make big mistakes. And I don't, it doesn't seem like you did. So how did you get that going to start off? A lot of it was the forms of bigger pockets. And so I, but I literally like, I read David Green's book, The Book on Austin Real Estate Investing. It's a great book. and I just followed the steps, like everything he said to do. I just, whatever he said to do, okay, reach out to realtors, we look at Redfin, talk to, make these phone calls on property management, do everything you need to do. I just, I literally just followed whatever the book said. I just took it step by step and just took consistent action. But I think a lot of my contacts were from the bigger pockets forums and reaching out to like wholesalers, to agents, to property managers and things on that forum, just because like, they were like minded. Yeah. I found that you can, the, the, just making a post about it will teach you a lot because you can see who's coming in trying to get your business and who's there just to say like, I love when I get a recommendation from somebody for somebody else. So I know it's not I don't like when people raise their own hand, because I feel like that's too easy. But if you just search like Indianapolis, you can find a ton of stuff, and then go through and then contact those people see if, you know, it worked out for them. 
So yeah. what's the makeup of the first property you bought? Was it turnkey, ready to go? Or did it, it was, need a little work? It was a I mean, the, I had two, like the backstory, I had no money to begin with. So 10 grand, 20 grand saved my bank account. There's no way for me to afford a property or a rental, like anything. And I also wanted to scale it because like, I didn't just want to buy one property and finish. So like the Burr strategy was like a huge, I guess, like strategy that I was going to use. So what I did was I had a decent job and a good credit score. So I went to like my local banks over here and I took out a personal lines of credit. So a personal line of credit is you can go to the local bank and say like the, that you don't need to have any assets. You just show them like your pay stub and your credit score. And you can take out like 15 to 30 grand in just like a line of cre- personal line of credit. And so what I did was I went to five banks all like in the same like walking distance and I applied for, and all the same day. So then when they asked me like, hey, do you have any other like debts? Like I have no other debts. Like I mean, like my credit card, like a, it was like, like very low balance and paid off. So then I opened up like 20, 15, 30, 15, 20. So I got five lines of credits o- equal to like over $100,000. It just lines of credit that I could pull. And that's what I used to like to purchase the first property, burn that out and likes to get my snowball going. So Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So were those lines of credit that don't activate until you actually use the funds or did you have to take the funds and start paying right away? Because that makes it a little bit more pressure. Just like you said in the beginning, it's it's like a line of credit. If you keep it there, like you're not paying any interest. When you have it, there's like a daily small balance that you're already going to pay or whatever the daily balance. When you put it back in, you're not paying any interest again. So let's take it out and use it for your deal and put it back. And you're only using what you need for that particular deal. What made you feel like you weren't going to be at risk of losing the money? Because I think some people do credit card situations instead of lines of credit and they make the mistake of going in too hard. What were you so confident about? Or maybe you weren't, but what made you know, like, oh, let me just take out five lines of credit. It's going to be okay. Number one, like taking out the lines of credit, there's no risk until you actually use it. So just having access to the money and actually using it are two separate things. But then the, to answer the point why the come through was just education, just seeing other guys like on bigger pockets or on these like podcasts who are actually doing it and hearing their stories, reading books and like just talking to other investors on the forum, just giving the confidence to where I had the tools and the things that I needed. And then I just did a ton of like research and due diligence as far as like vetting out contractors or property managers or the different neighborhoods and ages. And so like the more like information that I got, the more the risk I think goes down as far as just like vetting your team members and like that. Like, the yeah, I feel like new investors who have that like more of a high C on the disc test and are willing to do that due diligence, they feel much more comfortable when they finally make the steps. And then I feel like those are the investors like yourself who can scale a lot quicker because you built your own strategy and made it comfortable for yourself. And then it was like, okay, now I have to make it fit within what I want. I really like what you did with the markets too. You used your expertise to help Mm -hmm. yourself invest. And I think a lot of people also forget, like they have another career. There's Mm -hmm. something in the other career that can help you be a better investor. And you started off by using your data. If you're scraping the data, it's a great way to know. And then you can match it up with what you read on BP, right? I think I just being a software developer and just like a person in general, I'm very like analytical and logical. So just like numbers, very black and white. Does this make sense or this doesn't make sense? And so just looking through like data, I feel like that it gives you like a big picture of kind of what's going on. Obviously, there's some like nuances that data can't always give you the full picture. But like the more data that you accumulate, the bigger and like the more like bigger picture or a clear picture that you can have and whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So did you ever go on site to Indianapolis before you bought your first deal or was it fully remote? So we bought two, we did two projects, Burr projects, and then I went to visit Indianapolis after that. So (laughs) they were both rented when you went to visit? Yeah. One was in under rehab, the other one was completed. So, yeah. And how did it feel though, when you show up the first time, did you feel like this was a great decision once you saw the actual properties and it became even more real? Like it's tangible when you can touch the property. Yeah. I mean, it was, what's weird is I've grown up in Hawaii my whole life. So even the fact that there are homes that you could buy for like $50,000, that was a complete <laughs> shock for me too, because I'm like, you only know what you know, right? So like to me, a house is a million dollars. That's just what it is. I didn't think that you could buy a house for 50000 which like a, could be like the price of a car. So it was like just seeing like the neighborhoods and like the, and this the style of homes is way different than what we see in Hawaii. It's yeah. just, it was like, um, it was just like a big shock to just be in the city just to begin with, I think. But once I... Just like because like the, I seen pictures, my contractor, my project manager was sending me pictures and stuff. I already had it, and I had talked to agents. I'm on Zillow, Street View, walking the streets already. I kind of had a good feel for the city even before like before I seen foot inside. Yeah, so you did two burrs in Indianapolis. Do you still own those as rentals? Yeah, yeah. So we actually that first year we did six burrs, all so in Indianapolis. 
out in Indianapolis. Yeah. Wow, that's quick. How much rehab was needed on them? The first one was like 30 grand, which is like insane for us in Hawaii, but yeah. like dirt cheap. But then like it's, yeah, I was like, but at the time it was actually like really scary for me because no Compared risk. to the sales price, that's a lot though for what you were putting out and having the lines of credit. Yeah, the first purchase was $70,000 and then the rehab was 30. But then it was very scary. Like even this like wiring like 70 grand, like 70 grand, like I was very scared because this amount of money, and I heard whole stories about like people who were like, they get scammed out of wires or whatever. So like, yeah. I, I had to call like the telecom company on separate lines, just make verify, okay, is this legit? Is this legit? And so like anyone can make a fake website. I was like, I was very Absolutely. like, it was just very scary for me to start that first deal. Well, just doing again, just doing more research and due diligence just makes me feel like more comfortable like to move forward. So. Yeah, that's a good point you brought up. We haven't talked about it over these first episodes, but just a PSA for new investors or anybody doing a real estate deal, whenever you're going to send a wire, you always need to call the number and verify directly the account number. And you never use the phone number that's on the paper of yeah. the transaction. You have to go on the website, make sure that you're calling the correct person because they'll give you a different number on the website to verify it's a great yeah. point, but it's good that you were thinking about that wire fraud is real and you're not getting that money back if you get yeah. caught in it. Okay, so you did six burrs in Indianapolis. So in general, let's just go with the first one, 70 buy-in, 30 renovation. When you did the burr and you refied out, what was the appraisal value of that first one? It was 140 without one. Yeah, that's really great. Did that? So once you got that appraisal value of 140, was that like, okay, I can keep doing the same thing. That's like a crystallizing moment to know that you, kind of you like quickly a, made 40 grand. It was actually like a struggle for that because when I did the first appraisal, they appraised it at $70,000. And I was like, there's no way this should be $70,000 because like I did my research and everything. I said, I felt like 135 was like my ARV. Yeah. But then when I look at the comps that they use, one of the comps that they use was sold 60 grand. But then like it was on the market right now for 150 because it was another fix and flipper who was who bought it at a discount and then it was <laughs> right. it was another one the same thing it was like it was sold for like 80 but it was on the market for like 100 so like the comps they're using was it was just like way off and then so I was like dude like the, so i was okay like the, we have to fight this i feel like okay, i might have to go to another lender it doesn't make sense whatever so like but i submitted a rebuttal thinking like hey maybe if we can just get it up to 120 maybe we'll try and do the cash out refinance but Miracle, miracle is credit to the dude for actually like like actually changing because that's yeah. a big difference for 70, but then he gave he came back with like the new appraised value and they came back at 140. So that's like I'm like credit to the dude for waiting to admit his mistake, but then the new appraised value came at 140. And so we actually had to fight for that first appraisal or, or that first refinance to get it refinanced out. Yeah, that's another great tip though. And I think that if you give appraisers the correct data and you identify which things they did wrong without making them feel bad, which is yeah. tough because they can get touchy. As long as you can, I've won almost all my appraisals, maybe like 90%. And the ones that I didn't challenge, I just knew I wasn't going to win. We were yeah. just hoping that we would. But that's a that's another great point. It's another way to use data just to support your case. And you actually caught them maybe not paying attention because they were using a before repair value <laughs> for something that was already coming out. Awesome. So you finished six burrs in Indianapolis. And then where did you go next after that? So at that point in time, I had a small team. It was like, a, it was efficient as running. I was like, you're making after the burr, the process, you're making like hundreds to $200 a door, like net after expenses and everything. And so I was okay. So I just need 50 of these to reach like my <laughs> 10,000 like a month. And so like my only constraint right there was like the hundred that I had like in play. Of the yeah. two reasons for that, or like that, and I, and I, I actually took out like another loan. I guess my four hundred one k because you can take like a max like a fifty grand out of your four hundred one k. So that was extra money that I had to keep rolling into these projects. But then I was like, hey, if I had a little bit more cash, instead of doing let's say two at a time, now I could do four or six at a time to just make the I could reach that fifty number faster. And so at the same time that I was doing the birds, I was also networking and learning in my local market. And like Hawaii is a great fix and flip market because there's high prices, but also high profit margins. Yeah. But then as far as cash flow, it's not the greatest like cash flow state. And so I was like, if I could just take the exact same thing I'm doing in Indianapolis, finding good deals, fixing them and selling them, maybe I can make some like active income in Hawaii. And this could feed the burr machine that I had rolling into Indianapolis. Yeah. So did it was property seven, was that in Hawaii? Yeah, so that was in Hawaii. 
So like the but Hawaii, the Hawaii market is like it's very different than the Indianapolis market because like in Indianapolis there's like a ton of wholesalers, there's like deals slinging left and right. Yeah. But in Hawaii, there's no wholesalers like really, and there's very few and far in between like deals. And just the because the deals are bigger, like on a million dollar property, you have to make at least like a hundred thousand dollars profit in order to like for it to like the risk and for it to make sense, etc. Yeah. So, yeah. The amount of equity that your like homeowners are leaving on the table a lot of times when they they need to sell it for the price that you have to buy it at, and for various other reasons like limited inventory and like people's view of land and property, there's a lot less available deals to be found in Hawaii. And so the first part of it was just probably the first four months we just trying to lock up that first deal like in in Hawaii. Yeah. So what did you end up buying? What was the price point of that first flip in Hawaii? First one was three sixty. I bought it for. And was then, it a single family or a condo? It was a, it's like a, it was a duplex. It was like, it's this complicated Ohana. Du- it's basically, it's I know a, it is. Yeah. One, family, one in the back. Like, yeah. So it's like, it's a, it was like, oh, there's upstairs and downstairs, but it's on Ohana. So we had separate entrances and everything, but yeah. Yeah. So what, how much rehab was that, was needed on that one? So that one was, we put in $60,000 of paint contractors and materials, but I did a lot of sweat equity. So like, I basically lived there for the next two months. Like I just YouTube like construction, try to do my own plot. It was terrible. Like a lot of this stuff was like, I put in like my own counter, like cabinets and counters. I bought like for Mica, like this like, from Home Depot. Like I was just, yeah. I was like, Depot every day. Just so I did a lot of the work myself. I was thinking like that was how you had to do it. So lots how did of that work stuff. out. <laughs> and then when I had like my dad, so my dad's a little, hand, I'm super unhandy, but like you can learn so much in YouTube. So there was this one guy, I forgot what his name was. I think this Canadian dude that just, has DIY like YouTube stuff. And so like, I can do like hundreds of hours of just learning like the different parts of the rehab parts. And then like, dude, I can do my flooring myself. Like there's a bunch of things like painting, things that like, like it doesn't take a whole lot of scale that you can just put a sweat equity. So combination of me, my brother-in-law who I paid and then like my, my, my dad, like I did, but also contractors at the same time. So it's a combination yeah. of contractors and myself. We got all the work done for around 60 grand to, to fix it up. Yeah, do you feel like that was your first real like in person learning experience as to how hard it was going to be? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And like that. So the good thing is, I had a job as a software developer, so I would just do my work there while like during the day for whatever, like a few hours or how many hours. Then the rest of the day or night, I just like working on the project myself. So it's a combination of W two and work and the rehab at the, at the same location just because I had, could have the opportunity to do both. So. Yeah. On on a lot of prior podcasts, we've talked about the right time to leave, but it's so important to keep the W-2 because that's what's funding (laughs) what you're doing in addition to any like loan portals or lines of credit that you can get. And I feel like some new investors are so hopped up to leave, they want to leave but have no savings. And then there's also no job. So how can you invest with none of that? It's technically possible. But you need I, to have some backing for yourself. I 100% agree. And I know a lot of people will say just burn the ships, but I'm super, I'm like the exact opposite. I think you should only leave once you're like super sure that you can be responsible enough to leave. And it's going to be more work and effort like during that time. But then that's like the way more responsible or safe way. And you also get things like be able to refinance these properties or using your job and like income. There's a whole bunch of reasons why having a job at the same time is like a lot more of a safe way to, I think, like exit the W2 or the yeah. rent Absolutely. How, how many have you done in Hawaii now? A bunch, probably maybe over twenty. Like I'm not, I don't, I'm keeping last last count. I'm like a bunch. So like that. Yeah. Are those all flips, or do you have some holds in Hawaii now as well? A bunch of holds and yeah, a bunch of holds and some flips. So, so that, that, some... First deal, that first deal ended up being a burr actually. So it was very lucky. So intending to try and get to flips, but then the exit strategy for that one actually ended up being a burr. So like it's. The first deal was very lucky we got into burn that actually the first couple we did or like maybe like first out of the two out of the first three were actually were burn properties that actually like really boosted our income as far as like our passive income and to, to get to our number. Yeah. So are you working with partners on these deals, multiple or one or what's the... This, this, these are all myself. Like in the only recently we started to partner with people, but in the beginning it was just myself I and mean, we were we had a hard money lender to help fund the deal and then we raised some private money from some friends and family to fund the gap difference but then other than that it was just just like myself and yeah. yeah did you feel that it became easier to go to your family and friends at some point because you had built up a few had you built up a few deals where you made money so it's easier to go yeah. to family and friends and say no i already have a track record as opposed to doing it like right away 
hundred percent. When I first started, my friends and family were like, dude, what are you doing buying these properties on the mainland? You're going to lose your butt. I bought one. And then I was like, I think a month later, I bought the second one. And they're like, dude, what are you doing? Like everyone was like very shocked. And all my, like a lot of friends were like, this way me, like saying, you better be careful. Like what are you trying to do? And my coworkers are the same too. I was telling my coworkers, they're like, dude, you're crazy. But it's funny because once I had the success, like now my coworkers and my family who were in the beginning very anti, now they're lending on my deals and they want to learn and they want to partner and be a part of that. Once you have a track record, I think it makes a big difference than when you were first starting. So. Yeah, I think that's really important to note. I think too many investors are asking people for money right away. But why would somebody give you money on the first deal? They have no idea if you're going to do it. Then you do six in Indianapolis and you say, now I want to do it here. At least you have a metric. I know what I'm doing. Here's all the metrics of these six deals that I did. And then when you do it, like you said, on the mainland, they're going to start to see, okay, this is possible. Because a lot of them probably thought like you did, you can't do it. It's to the prices are too high in Hawaii or there's no spread. It's just a different type of thing. You have to buy and hire usually, but your your profit margin is going to be bigger if you do it right. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, 100%. Yeah, awesome. Let's get into some of our questions. We did talk about this already, but your greatest influence in real estate, bigger pockets and the books. What I think when you started to go through the books, you were just like consuming so many. What was yeah. it about? Was it just did you want to learn everything you could about real estate? So you had multiple options when you started to come into buying? I think it's like my personality where like, I'm kind of like an all or nothing guy. Like whenever I dive into something, whether it's like a video game or a sport or like a hobby, I'm just like, I just, I dream about it day and night. I just think about it like all the time. So it's, a, it's like a 24 seven obsession, I think. And so like when I found like just like real estate investing, it was like, I just was like super hungry just to like learn, learn, learn. and just consume as much as I could. And just yeah, like, literally just dream about it, think about it. Even when I'm working as my software developer, I'm just like thinking about like, what can I do here or there? And just trying to consume more, listen to podcasts every single like, uh, like on all the rides and everything, you know, just, it was just like a, became an obsession to kind of like learn and to grow as an investor. Yeah, I find podcasts to be so like great. I started listening to them always when I was in the car. And then if you drive a lot for work, you can get in like a ton of learning. If you're just two hour commute, which a ton of people have, you can have two hours more of learning. You can really learn a lot about real estate investing quickly and all different points of view. When you listen to bigger podcasts, there's just so many different things that can come to you that you can figure out. And some stuff you're going to bookmark for later, like apartment buildings and things like that. But I still find almost every episode is going to be useful to somebody. Yeah, definitely. And then just like when I'm cleaning my house, anything, any chance I get, I'm always listening to something or an audio book or something. But I'm also like a very fast reader. So I think I can, I'm a pretty fast, like I can consume like the books very quickly. But yeah, in the beginning, I just goes just went into it 100% to just learn it and to just feel more comfortable. Yeah. So as you got into it more, I know that you've gone to a ton of meetups and events. What kind of impact have those had? Because I think some people stay behind the computer a lot. And that can be good. You can learn a ton in the forums. But I've seen or connected on social media, I've seen you at events. How much has that changed your perspective to kind of network with people who are doing what you want to do? I think like one of the, my, my only small, small regret was that I didn't start going out and networking earlier just because I think, I think there's a value to figuring out yourself as far as just like you saw the problems, you go through like the bumps and the bruises, but like the network, when you, there's a bunch of different reasons why networking is awesome. Number one is like inspiration and motivation. Like when you're around talking to other guys, you see what guys are accomplishing. It just motivates you as far as you to do more. Another thing is just like mindset, like the, they say you're like the average of the five people you hang around with, right? So like when I was a software developer, my whole goal was like, hey, if I can just make six figures, I've made it in life. That's good. Nothing against my friends, but like the, they're, everybody was working at W2 and nobody was like really making a whole lot of income. And so compared to my friends, I was doing very well. But then now when I'm going to these meetups and talking to these guys who are making $100,000 a month, now this is my mind of what's possible and what's like available and like reasonable is it's totally different today. And so yeah, mindset and then like resources or someone needs money, someone has deals, someone has a connection to like a contact. There's so many like resources that are exchanged and like we all have different skill sets or different weaknesses and bringing to the table and helping each other out. It just makes everybody like everybody rise together like on the, like on the tide. Yeah, I feel like going to events and then meeting investors really takes away the mystery. And I've found that like investors are literally everybody. So when you're a new investor, you think, oh, it's going to be like all fancy people investing. And then you get there and it's no, nobody cares. Everybody wears shorts. Nobody. It's like everyone. 
And I think that's what makes it so encompassing, like you said, to know, like, you're going to see people just like you and people Mm -hmm. who you didn't think would be a, quote, investor. And then you realize, wait, no, everybody can be an investor. And it's funny because this might come across, I'm not sure how this is going to come across, but like when you go to these meetups, you see like very successful people and they're not super smart. They're like, they're, there's no wow factor. They're just like, I just followed the path and I just worked hard and boom, they're, they're super, super successful. Yeah, you, I know what you're saying. You don't need to have multiple degrees to be a successful investor. You just need to be able to follow a plan, be consistent and take it. It's really, you don't, you can have no degree and do really well at investing. You just have to make the right moves, make the right connections and probably yes. be an asset to people is what's going to get you the farthest with who you meet. Yeah. It's a great point. I mean, it just like, like changes. I was like, if these guys can, if this guy can do it, like, why can't I basically it just, it changes like your mindset of what you think like you can achieve when you see like normal, ordinary people just a crazy accomplishing like crazy things so. yeah that's what i mean it takes it off it's like there's not like a ton of celebrity investors and if mm-hmm. there were i don't think most of us would be interested because it's like that's not the showy part's not really the interesting part it's mm-hmm. getting it done and how you get to the passivity part or at least in terms of like passive income even though i don't find real estate investing to be super passive the yeah. income's coming in what they call mailbox money that's what everybody's after at some yeah. point, did you are you still doing the software development or have you left the job? So in 2021, actually, like in the beginning or in the middle of the year, we built up enough rental income. We had a lot of luck, like high cash flowing properties in Hawaii that we burned, where I would replace my six figure income with just net pass- passive income. And so like yeah. the, it was like so we replaced my income at my W2. And then I was like, I'm ready to like. They just do this full time. But then my wife was not super like uncomfortable. I mean, comfortable with that. So like, it took a little bit more convincing and negotiating with her. But once she was on board, then like at the end of 2021, I quit my job and then just been doing real estate investing like full times ever since. Yeah, but that's important. I think if you have a spouse or partner, you want to make sure you're all on the same page because your future is tied together. So it's like you're want to figure out and also prove to your wife, like, no, this is real. I can do that. Has her interest in real estate also changed over this time? Or yeah, she's just saying, you just do your thing, bring it when home. We, when we first started, she was one super anti, don't, do not invest in real estate. So it, it was a big negotiation for that first deal to like, to, to negotiate with her to make sure it was okay. Yeah. And then, and then over time, man, she's seen success and she's actually even like, she helps out here and there. So like we, I taught her like, yeah, like that first project, Hey, can you help me with flooring? Can you help me with like painting or like installing cabin houses and everything? So she's had like kind of an active part in a few of the rehabs, like putting in some sweat equity. But then she also is like, the, she has her own career and she wanted to focus on her own career. And she doesn't want to take away too much of the focus away from that. But I think like one of the good pieces of advice that I got when we were in our pre-medal counseling that I still remember and use in our investing journey was that my pastor told me that, hey, Don, you're going to come to these times when it's going to make the absolute sense to make this financial decision. And you can, like, you're going to make a lot of money, but your wife's not going to be on board. You cannot make the decision. You just have to choose to like let that opportunity go. And then only if your wife is on board, can you make the decision. And I feel like there was a couple of times in our career where I was like, I really wanted to do this thing. But just like listening to my pastor's advice, it was like the right decision to make because if you're not on the same page, it's going to cause like friction and things in the future. And even if it ends up turning well financially, the relational strain or things like sometimes it's not worth it. So just be on the same page and you're going to give up opportunities. Maybe you'll save yourself from some headache down from certain situations, but you always have to be as like a unified front in like big decisions that you guys are making. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And that's something I think you can bring with you to just money partnerships. So when you're partnering with somebody else, you always want to be on the same page or else it's going to be a problem later. I flipped with my best friend. We pretty much don't agree on everything, but we also know like we both know what we're doing. So it's not that big a deal. It's not like we're deciding to knock down half of a house or not. We pretty much agree on the big stuff. But you can take those lessons from what you learned in those relationship building for your marriage and then take them over to real estate as well. I think that's very smart. So we talked about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. 
and Burr, but you said something interesting. And I have one thing that we could collectively do together to make the real estate investing world better. You talked about it a little, but it's helping out each other as much as possible. And I feel like you do that on your social. You're trying to give people insight into what you did within four years to do it. How has that kind of helped you grow on your journey to help other people along the way as well? It's really crazy because I think when I first started, like there was... I think I, when I first started, I had a few bad experiences as a new B investor where some seasoned investors were like assholes or like dick to me. And so like yeah. from those experiences, I was like, yeah, I don't ever want to be like that to like a new investor because of that. And so like whenever new people come and ask questions, I try my best to give them time or give them advice within reason. And so it's funny, but like I never expected to get anything back from like a lot of those early interactions. But years later, it comes back. And because of that, they're like, they'll bring me a deal or they'll bring me a contact or money or they're coming in to, to give me a good reference with somebody else. And it's like weird how this, the law of the universe works where you give it, you just put it out there and try to serve as many people. And then like naturally, like not even expecting something to come back out. It's just like in the future, they just you actually get rewarded for that. And so it's just, it's just cool that's happening. But like, I didn't realize how powerful that was back then. But now that I see how powerful it is, it just makes me want to do more and give more like in the future, both because I enjoy giving, but also just because like I see the benefit in the long term too. So Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's a like a light bulb moment for new investors listening. You just have to give of your time. If you have things that you've done in the past that can help an investor bring that to the table if you want mentorship. And if you build relationships, I always say the investing world is much smaller than people think. It seems yeah. like there's a million investors, but most of them fail. So the ones who succeed are you're all going to end up knowing each other. So you don't want to mess up those relationships along the way. Like you said, it doesn't help to for someone to be rude to you when you're trying to get started. But like you also said, there's ways where if you want to approach someone, you need to come to the table with something because people are busy. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So if you had one piece of advice for brand new real estate investors in this market, like the current economic climate now going into 2023, what advice would you give to new investors based on what you've experienced over the last four years? I think based on like the new, based based on the market and just from what I've seen, I think it's very important to be very conservative with your numbers and hopefully like partner with another experienced investor. I think having a second set of eyes on your deal just to make sure that like you're not going to get yourself into trouble or see the hiccups on the road that they can predict that you might not be able to see, I think. And so just especially in today's market where I've seen a lot of friends or newer investors come into the space and not necessarily make the greatest decisions as far as like writing their numbers. And now when the market is going up, you can kind of like, It'll fudge your numbers because you'll still make money because of the market saves you. But now when the market is dipping, it's actually going to even hurt you further. And so I've seen some guys get into some bad deals where it looks like they might lose money. And it's just if they just had a hand like holding them or partnering with them in the beginning, they could have avoided like a lot of this like stress that they're feeling right now. Yeah, it's great. And more reason to find those in-person meetups in your area to get one-to-one with people so you can really tell more who you can trust in person. Great. Daniel, it's been a pleasure. Where is the best place for people to find you? I know you're active on Instagram and TikTok. Why don't you give everybody your tags on those? Your app? Yeah, I'm at Daniel Kong 808 at Instagram and TikTok. So feel free to reach out and shoot me a DM. If you got questions or things, I'm always available to point you in the right direction or give you some advice, like the best to my best of my ability. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It was great to meet you. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Yeah, same. Thanks for having me on, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. That was Daniel Kong, and I am Jonathan Green. This has been episode 26 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. We'll see you next week. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends. And be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. 